Sleepy Shoopy here. Today we're going to be looking at a level 125 strength build utilizing a bunch of different weapons and taking advantage of both rot and poison. So we'll be using the heavy stone club as well as the coil shield, the cestus, and the antsper rapier. We'll be using a mix of poison and rot, so for weapons that have innate rot buildup like the antsper rapier, we won't really need to make too many changes. We'll be putting rot grease on both of our cestuses, and then we have poisonous mist on our stone club. However, we might be putting rot grease on it depending on the situation. And then we also of the coil shield which is a great way to proc deadly poison rather than just the regular poison buildup. As for our armor we'll be running the mushroom crown which boosts our AR when we proc poison or rot. We'll also have the fingerprint armor gauntlets and greaves just to bring us to 71 poise with the bull goat talisman and then we'll also use the crimson amber medallion plus two, Millicent's prosthesis, and kindred rot's exaltation talisman which also boosts our AR when we proc poison. However we may change that up and utilize the Rotten Wing Sword Insignia depending on the weapon. I really liked using the Kindred Rot's Exaltation with the Stone Club just because I found proccing poison with Poisonous Mist to be very easy, and then switching it over to the Rotten Wing Sword Insignia if I was using something like the Cestus, which has a bunch of quick succession hits that are very easy to land, especially with the true combo. I'll be running 60 Vigor, 12 Mind, 22 Endurance, 70 Strength, and 15 Dexterity. However, Millicent's Prosthesis will raise those Dexterity points to 20, which allows us to use the Ansper Rapier, which does have a 20 Dex requirement. The 12 mine definitely isn't necessary. You can drop those extra two points into strength, vigor, or endurance. It doesn't really matter, but I just used my Ash of War a decent amount, so I wanted to have a little bit of extra FP. One last thing to note about the level spread for this build is that when you two-hand your weapon, you get a 1.5 strength multiplier for your level, and that brings you over the hard cap of 80. So you could run this build at 54 strength if you plan on two-handing your weapon a lot, and then pour those points into other things. You could do more endurance or some some arcane and make it more of a hybrid build, but I just went for this pure strength build for this particular showcase. As for our physic, we'll be running the Thorny Crack tier to further boost our successive attacks, which pairs nicely with the Rotten Wind Sword Insignia as well as Millicent's Prosthesis, and then I'll also use the Crimson Bubble tier just to restore HP when I'm close to death. The strategy for this build is pretty nice because I think it has a lot of different counters associated with it, so if we have really aggressive players, the two-handed Stone Club moveset is going to be pretty solid. We can also go for a mix-up of of poisonous mist and get that AR boost if we proc poison very early on. Also, if you don't proc poison immediately with poisonous mist, your opponent will likely have a lot of buildup from it, and you can go for the coil shield ash of war, which means that when the poison does proc, which it most likely will, you'll get that deadly poison buildup rather than just regular poison. So that's pretty nice. And then once we proc poison, we definitely can switch over to rot on our main weapon and that will add another layer of tech damage to kind of the pressure associated with this build. So that can be a really nice element as well. So for really aggressive players, the Stone Club is gonna be great, especially if it's a weapon with shorter range, it's a nice counter to something like a Cestus. And then for burst damage, we can switch over to our Cestus and the running heavy to heavy combo is really great. Also, you can go for a block and then heavy attack and then chain those for roll catches or to just kind of vortex your opponent. So that's really strong. And again, you can put rock grease on those as well and contribute to the status buildup. I really like switching over to the Rotten Wing Sword Insignia if I'm going to be using the Cestus just because you get so many successive attacks. And then for players that are light rolling, I really like having a thrusting sword just because the roll catch on the running heavy is very solid. Also having something like the regular light attack that just comes out very, very quickly is really nice. And regular heavy attacks are great too for stance breaking your opponent. So between these three weapons, we have a lot of variety and a lot of good counters for different setups. And we'll be trying to incorporate all of them, but really the stone club is gonna be the main weapon and for the majority of the duels especially, we'll be seeing the Stone Club as our main weapon. That pretty much covers everything that I wanted to say about this build and the strategy we'll be employing. Before we jump into the Invasion Showcase and duels, I wanted to mention that this is going to be a two-part series at least. So I've got a bunch of other clips that won't be shown in this particular showcase, and we'll look at this build again without the details about the setup. So uh, keep an eye out for that. We will be looking at this a second time, which is a little bit unusual for this channel, but I had a lot of fun with this build. I feel like there's enough variety to give it the extra air time. So we'll look at that as well. If you wouldn't mind considering subscribing, I definitely appreciate it and let's go ahead and jump into the invasions 
All right, so jumping into our first invasion, we're in the Faramizula pre-boss fight area for Malekith the Black Blade, and we're dealing with two melee players. Somebody's using bleed, and we also have a person casting in the back. So I've used spellproof liver just to negate some of the incoming magic damage. I definitely recommend that. If you have the time to utilize a consumable like that, it can be really nice just because you'll frequently see a lot of consistent spam and if you can negate any incoming chip damage just as much as possible, if you mistime your roll or something or need to go for a trade, it'll be helpful in the long run. So I'm going for a lot of whiff punishes on the player with the Colossal Sword, and I'm also trying to keep my opponents frosty. So using something like Frost Pots is gonna be a great way to just get the most out of every single hit that you land because their damage negation is lowered by 20%. So every single hit you do land is gonna be a little bit stronger. And I do manage to get a couple quick successive attacks in on the player with the white mask. So I definitely recommend kind of turn and burns and quick bursts of aggression with the stone club because if your opponent stays aggressive against you, you'll frequently have priority for your consecutive R1 attacks and consistently poise break your opponent, meaning that you'll you know hit them three times in a row and they'll often die from just three hits with the stone club. So the kind of drawback of the stone club is that if your opponent is somebody that's frequently going to roll out from your attacks, then you'll usually only hit them once, they'll roll away, and roll catching is a little bit difficult. I definitely recommend the crouch attack for roll, roll catches, just as a, a bit of a mix-up. Don't only go for R1s, because those are fairly telegraphable, especially the running R1. So eventually, it's just the Colossal Sword and the Mage that I'm dealing with. I'm still going for the whiff punishes with the Stone Club. However, I am frequently, you know, playing a little bit more defensively when we have incoming Ashes of War from the Ritual Spear as well as some casting from the, the mage in the back. So, you know, not trying to rush things, I'm pretty confident that I'll be able to uh, effectively chip the, the Phantom here and just, you know, not get too aggressive. So what happens here is I go into my menu hoping to use the Antsper Rapier. However, I've switched off Millicent's Prosthesis and don't have the stats for it. So that's definitely something to be aware of. In later iterations, I switched where Millicent's prosthesis was in my talisman setup, just so that I'd be less likely to swap off of it and therefore maintain my ability to use the Ansper Rapier. So definitely keep that in mind, but it didn't end up mattering too much. I did get hit a couple times by the Colossal Sword, but I was still able to kind of punish them with the Stone Club. And then we do see that the host is running pretty low vigor and just a couple quick hits with the Stone Stone Club are enough to finish them off even though they switch to Moonveil. This next invasion is kind of the optimal moment you'll experience with something like the Stone Club. So we're able to run in and proc poison on everybody, then go back and apply our Rot Grease. So now we'll be able to proc Rot if we don't kill our opponents too quickly. And then everybody kind of runs in one by one. And that's going to be awesome because the coordination is kind of poor. I'm not dealing with too much at once and everybody's, the one person that's running in at a time is staying pretty aggressive. So I'm able to get a couple quick hits on the player with the Serpent Hunter. And then when this player goes for their Ash of War with the God Slayer Greatsword, I'm able to just kind of roll around them a little bit and set myself up for a nice backstab. So we didn't get the Rot proc, but we did get the Poison proc, and our AR was definitely boosted by our successive attacks as well. And just kind of having priority over something like a Twin Blade in that situation was was really nice because Twin Blades are pretty fast, but we have just kind of the, the high poise damage two-handed Stone Club as well as the successive attacks that meant that if my opponent stayed aggressive there, they'd be in trouble. So next up we have a dedicated gank team. It is a 2v2, however that doesn't last for too long and you can kind of see why we have the Sleep Halberd, which is definitely something to be worried about. So I go ahead and switch my talismans real quick just so that I'm less likely to get the sleep proc and the sleep buildup is, you know, a little bit negated. And then I run in to try to help my teammate. However, it's kind of too little too late, they go down. And this player does switch over to the Great Bow, which 
gives me a little bit of extra space. I'm able to dodge the kind of rain of arrows, ash of war, and my health is pretty low, but I'm able to get in two quick heals that kind of make the difference there. And then the opponent with the sleep buildup, you can see how close they got me. It was extremely close, and had I not used that talisman, I wouldn't have been able to kind of get out of that situation, definitely would have died. So definitely, if you do see that Ripple Crescent Halberd and sleep grease on it, switch that talisman because it can totally save your life. I also switched over to the Cestus and that was super helpful in getting some burst damage, getting that, you know, running heavy to heavy combo on somebody, you know, that can just do a ton of damage very quickly. So that 2v2 or 2v2 really worked out in my favor and I was able to, you know, deal with a pretty meta, pretty dangerous build. This next invasion is going to be a 3v1, and I'm able to bait my opponents towards the PvE, and that's going to allow me to have a little bit of extra space and just deal with my opponents a little bit better. Here, I do get parried with the Cestus, and I think that's super important to see just because, you know, you can get parried pretty easily with the Cestus, especially if you're going for that running heavy, running uh, or just regular uncharged heavy afterwards. And you can see after I get parried once, I totally change up my approach. I'm not running in and going for attacks. I probably shouldn't have gotten parried that first time, but I just kind of had some muscle memory when it came to the running heavy followed up by the heavy, and it really, you know, kind of didn't work out in my favor. So I switch over to the player with waves of gold, and I think that's definitely the right move. And as they start kind of panic rolling away, I do a quick weapon swap over to the Ansper Rapier, just because that's going to be a little bit easier to roll catch with. The terrain is not really doing me any favors, just because it's allowing me to kind of miss my running attacks. But eventually I do land a running heavy on the, the player that was panic rolling while kind of dancing around the incoming damage from the player with the Colossal Sword. And here I do a quick talisman swap just so that when I use my um, Crimson Tears, I'll be able to get a little bit of extra HP. So if you have space, if somebody's you know deciding they want to slow walk at you, you can take advantage of that. And then here I go for a parry this moment where I switch over to the Coil Shield and kind of anticipated that they were going to go for a parry and that long recovery animation from the parry allowed me to land a coil shield kill which you know always feels good and then eventually i do catch up to the host but we have kind of a bad connection so they're able to roll through most of what i'm going for i do go for the <laughs> viper bite on the coil shield again and don't manage to land at that time but I do manage to land it here, and so Deadly Poison is now procced, which means that I can switch over to a setup with Rot. So I switch over to the Ansper Rapier. This is also a little bit better for just dealing with the, the bad connection. If I have something like Deadly Poison in the mix, as well as something like Rot, then I don't really have to worry as much about the bad connection. Those things will be affecting the player, regardless of if I'm landing hits. And Phantom hits are definitely more effective against, you know, a player with a little bit of lag as well so i'm just trying to not get blood loss build up and you know they're wearing the white mask so i'm conscientious of that as well and eventually they go for a couple trades ansper rapier is definitely faster than their attacks and i'm able to proc rot as well so i've procced deadly poison and now rots in the mix and my ar is buffed so i switch over to the cestus and just grab a couple quick hits that are enough to kind of kill my opponents there so Next we have a 3v1, and this is just going to be another showcase of how useful the stone club is when you have people that are aggressive. So two hits and this opponent is almost dead. Going for the chase down is a little bit difficult with the stone club. Again, I do recommend crouching attacks even though I didn't go for it there, but I was able to kind of chase that opponent down, get that kill, and then backstab the host, and then Oh, the uh, Phantom, rather, sorry. And then it's just me and the host left. They do pull out a Coil Shield of their own, so I feel like I'm obligated to pull out mine and do land a Viper Bite followed up by a Stone Club hit that is enough to finish off the host there. So a very quick just 3v1 and a uh, moment I was pretty happy about. This next 3v1 is going to be one that involves a light rolling player with the Eclipse Shuttles and then two Phantoms that uh, one of them is casting a bit and then I believe the other has Bloodhound Fang. And I don't like the situation I'm in. I was kind of surprised by my opponents. They 
kind of popped up on me a little bit earlier than I expected. So I didn't have time to use my physic, which I usually like to do at the beginning. So right now I'm mostly just trying to get into a spot that I feel like is a better fighting ground. And I'm also aware that there may be some PVE available if I continue running. I'm also not letting them get too close. So a quick turn and burn when they're a little bit uncoordinated can be helpful to just try to get people to back off. So if everybody is close together and you'll get blendered by turn and burning, I, I don't recommend it at all. But in instances where you can just kind of turn around and get one or two quick hits in, it's, it's gonna be great, especially if you have a weapon with low recovery time on the attack animation. So the stone club, I can just roll out of or run away from almost immediately. But if I were to use a colossal sword or something, then the turn and burn would really commit me to that spot for longer than I'd want to be there and I'd be more likely to get blundered. So I'm also throwing some freezing pots, just, you know, any extra damage I can do as well as getting my opponent's frostbitten is going to be helpful. And I'm continuously just kind of rolling down this hill because I do know that there is a dragon in this area. And soon enough, we will be seeing that dragon just kind of <laughs> popping in and the cadence of the fight changes a little bit. So there the dragon does swoop in. I've switched over to a Cestus. I feel like the burst damage is gonna be pretty useful. And especially when you're playing against somebody with light roll, it can be really useful to have a true combo where you can you know, hit them with the running heavy, followed up by the heavy, and that is going to stun lock them in one spot for longer than say, you know, the stone club. So here we can just see the, the full combo. We get 1100 damage. It's pretty solid for putting me back in a, a better spot to deal with a 3v1 and turning it into a 2v1. And now there's one less player to deal with. Everybody's backpedaling. So really the, the cadence of the fight is totally different now. And I have the opportunity to be a little bit more aggressive and just kind of utilize the aggression of this build. So we have the host and light rolling player just kind of abandon their phantom here. And my build is gonna be a, a lot stronger against somebody with just the, the Bloodhound Fang. If I stunlock them once, I'll be probably in a good spot to, to vortex them. And we do see some aggression from the host, but I get them very close to death. Back off a little bit, but throw some fan daggers in their direction. And then that allows me to switch my attention over to the player with Bloodhound Fang. And we do get the host coming back in to try to get a little defense uh, for their phantom, but it's again, too little too late. And we are in a much better spot here. And again, we have another player with dual curve swords and we can see how the priority for the stone club wins out in those moments, especially if you know you have at least a little bit of poise, you'll be able to kind of tank some of the incoming hits and poise break your opponent consistently. Obviously this light rolling player does not have much poise and we kind of begin the the chase down sequence. So I switch over to the Ansper Rape here because one, I, I can proc Rot and I've already proc'd Poison. So we can kind of maintain the chip damage and they're light rolling. So having something that's a little bit better for roll catching is going to be pretty nice. The running heavy has enough forward momentum where if you are close enough and they do light roll, you can still time it for a roll catch. So that's going to be pretty helpful. They are doing a decent job of kind of keeping jumps in the mix as well as turning a bit. And I'm also using fan daggers. When you have an opponent that is running almost no armor, fan daggers are super effective because they are more likely to poise break your opponent, even though they're fan daggers. And they do just a lot of damage. So definitely recommend utilizing fan daggers in the mix when you do see an opponent with almost no armor because it, it, it's gonna be super effective at kind of slowing them down and just doing chip damage. So next up we have a 2v1 and this one was kind of interesting. There's a lot of patience on both sides, I think. I was trying to kind of funnel them through this doorway and they weren't really taking the bait. And I also had a very hard time popping the bubble for the Phantom with the Blasphemous Blade. So I go for a couple different fan daggers on them and just kind of either get unlucky with the aim or, you know, just don't get a connection with the fan dagger. So I'm not going to commit myself to a an attack that I know won't do any damage. So I really am kind of, I, I want to land the fan daggers before I go for an attack with my stone club. And I definitely recommend that. Obviously it's not always practical. Sometimes you can, you know, break the bubble with your main weapon, but it does commit you to a spot. So being able to 
utilize just a, a fan dagger or just any projectile really to pop that bubble beforehand, I think is gonna be pretty beneficial. So I'm trying to just kind of ignore the the host and dodge their attacks because they're going for two great swords it's pretty telegraphable and i'm in a great spot to just kind of see the attacks coming for the most part as long as they're on screen which is is definitely important and just not get hit by them you know roll when i need to unless i'm stun locked so that's going to be an issue in, in some cases but here i go for kind of the trade i know that i'll get hit by the host but i feel that it's worth it to kill the phantom and ends up being kind of the correct decision i've already got a bit of an understanding of how much damage they're doing and i think that i'll be able to tank just the neutral l1 from the dual great swords and then there i did what i talked about in the beginning of the video which was get some of the poison proc and then switch over to the coil shield to get the rest of the poison proc with deadly poison rather than just the regular poison it didn't end up mattering too much but the viper bite does does it does a decent amount of damage and it, i think it scales with strength as well so you know having some sort of more ranged attack with weird timing can be great. So the next one I just thought was kind of funny. I did some talisman swaps at the beginning so I'd be able to use rejection and just ran over to the host and kind of yeeted them off the chain. So uh, knowing what options you have available with talisman swaps I think is important. And if you show up in a spot like that, I think it can be great to just utilize something like rejection to have kind of a little bit of extra fun. So the sex invasion, we've knocked two players down into the hole and we're left with just an isolated third phantom. And once we kind of get the rhythm of their attack patterns down, we're able to stance break them with just a couple light attacks from the stone club and take care of them. And then I begin kind of the chase down on the other two players. So it takes a little bit of time. It is nice because the poison means I can see where they are on the map more generally, just because it's taking their damage. And I do jump down and kind of miss that jumping attack. So not great there, but I, you know, go into for some trades with this opponent and just the, second trade there is enough to take care of them they weren't going they weren't landing as much damage i had just proc poison with poisonous mist and my ar was buffed significantly so my trades do win out against them and then here the chase on the the host was you know a little bit tiresome i, I edited some of it out but we do switch over to the ants rapier just because it's a little bit better for chasing down and then my opponent does get pretty close to the fog wall I wasn't sure if they were going to fog wall or go for the site of grace. Had they been going for the site of grace and there wasn't a fog wall just, you know, right in that spot, I probably would have let them grab the site of grace. But, uh, you know, you, you really can't be sure when you have a site of grace so close to a fog wall. It's just kind of better to nip that in the bud as soon as possible. So next up we have a 2v1 and this Brunark host gets very close to dying almost immediately. We've got um, poison in the mix but it doesn't quite proc so they were able to kind of get away but we are able to land a couple jumping attacks on the the phantom and just take them out of the picture very very quickly so I, I do love that and then here's another one of the like parry this moments where we're able to utilize the uh, ash of war of viper bite just when we know our opponent's going for some parries so we've landed deadly poison and then again we switch over to the rot grease because we're hoping to get both the poison and rot in the mix just really maximize that tick damage and we're also getting some some pretty good hits on our opponent they're kind of in this you know estus punish cycle that's really hard to deal with in a small space when you're up against a stone club and we're able to land just a few more hits and finish off the host there and come out on top so lastly we're gonna have just a well it starts out as a one-on-one -on -one with a rune arc kind of bonfire duelist or taunter's tongue, I imagine. Um, we do get some blues that come into the mix, but I just wanted to, to showcase this because this was one where we had an opponent dealing with both the rot buildup, the deadly poison buildup, so just massive tick damage. And we do have the blue come in. They're pretty aggressive, really just going for their straight sword swings. And it's not effective against the stone club. So I'm very quickly able to, you know, land about 1700 damage and kind of negate their existence from being a factor in this invasion. And then here, the just kind of chip damage and continuous pressure that comes with the stone club as well as rot and poison you can just see how deadly it is we're able to kind of continuously estus punish our opponent and come out on top 
Moving on to the dual portion of the showcase, we have a player with dual katanas and they quickly go for chilling mist just to get some frostbite in the mix. So I also try to go for a freezing pot there and that can be a good way to bait your opponent into an attack. They can try to punish the recovery animation. I'm able to get two quick hits in and then land the Viper Bite. So landing it in duels was a little bit easier than I was expecting. I mean, it wasn't super easy, but it definitely happened with some consistency. And we can see there the deadly poison is enough to finish off our opponent. Next, we have a player with the Cestus. And the Stone Club, I feel, is a, is a pretty good counter to it. So it doesn't have the same level of damage output as the Cestus does. And the ability to Vortex players is not quite as strong. But the little bit of extra range that you get with the neutral attacks and the speed at which you get them can be kind of a deciding factor. So, you know, if you do get hit with a couple uncharged heavies, especially if they know the timing pretty well, it can be dangerous. So there, I do wait for the second heavy to come out after my opponent goes for it once, just because I think they're going to delay it a little bit. And I do get the roll timing correct. And that allows me to be in a great spot to just punish them a little bit more. And the poison, again, is a factor here where they're very low on health and the tick damage does wear down their health completely. And I also find the Stone Club to be pretty useful against something like Dual Straight Swords. So here we can see a, a very meta build. We can, you know, we need to be wary of the damage output that comes with it, especially if we get stun locked. But the Dual Straight Swords setup does have a 69 poise damage breakpoint. So having our 71 poise is going to be an important factor when, you know, tanking one hit from the dual straight swords and you know they, they could be going for chip damage or something with the fan daggers but it doesn't end up being a factor here they're really sticking to the straight sword setup and we're able to land a couple of light attacks and also proc poison and that adds a little bit of pressure and then we're just able to kind of uh, understand that they're going to go for a neutral attack and punish it with a jumping attack so this next player was uh, using a build that I wasn't a huge fan of. They'll spend the majority of this fight running away. And, you know, they are a mage, so that's, you know, the optimal play style in a lot of instances. You know, run away and then go for stun locking turn and burn, something like the spinning weapon that goes on staffs, which is, it's not something to ignore. It's very powerful and you can really lose a lot of damage. They were going for carry and slicer, but I was able to read that attack well enough to get a stun lock on them. But the continuous use of these kind of dagger, I think it's a, the phalanx, is going to be a factor for sure. And I need to maintain my health as much as possible, really choose my moments when to be aggressive and when not to be because their ability to turn and burn is very strong. So there they go for spinning weapon, but I'm able to stun lock them first. I think using fan daggers more throughout this particular duel would have been a good way to kind of punish the fact that they're light rolling and using very uh, low defense armor but I am able to just kind of continuously pressure with the Ansper Rapier and just, you know, dodge their incoming attacks well enough. If I had a little bit more time as well, I would also be trying to negate the damage with a Spellproof Liver or something, but there I was able to dodge their Carrion Piercer, which was definitely a good turn and burn idea by them, and get another hidden, and now I'm feeling like I'm, you know, more close to being able to kill them. So they go for an FP, uh, drink and I really would have liked to punish that but I was able to get them with just a running heavy I think they thought they were spacing well enough but they were kind of incorrect with that decision so I was very happy to come out on top against a player using that type of build those builds are not fun to play against in my opinion and just very effective so next up we have a another player using a great sword as well as an off stock and we're able to punish that pretty well with the stone club and then go in for a bit of a trade against sword dance and just land the last bit of damage necessary to come out on top and then next up we have another great sword player this player uses uh, bloodhound step quite a lot as well as some consumables so we do need to look out for that but just spacing them well and not getting too aggressive is important. You can definitely get caught up in a bunch of great sword attacks if you're not careful. So I'm trying to play unpredictably, you know, go for one attack, go for two consecutive attacks, but not really do that with any particular cadence or repeatability. And just look out for their Bloodhound step because it's 
you know, gonna get them away from me pretty effectively. And if I can wait for them to Bloodhound step, go for their attack and whiff punish or something, then I'll be in a good spot. But eventually I am able to get the last bit of damage just against their back step, which was, I'm not sure if it was intentional or if they were going for a ravioli step, but either way, uh, we were able to come out on top there. Next up, we have a, another fight against a greatsword player, and they're using the pokes pretty pretty effectively. I'm able to land the coil shield viper bite early enough after you know not landing the poison proc with poisonous mist, and then just get really aggressive towards the end there. So playing passively and then switching over to like pure aggression can definitely be a way to catch your opponent off guard and really land a bunch of hits in a row. So here again, we're able to proc poison very early in the fight, which is definitely ideal. And then the slow attack speed of the magma curve sword is really just easily punished by the stone club. And we get lots of quick attacks there that kind of finish off our opponent. Next, we'll be playing against a melee wizard hybrid build. So we're gonna need to look out for the incoming projectiles as well as any damage with their main hand weapon. So they start off with a dagger. However, they will be switching over to a colossal sword and they're going for attacks with a glinstone Chris, but I'm able to actually punish that with a viper bite attack. So deadly poison is now in the mix and we can be a little bit more aggressive, especially with our health advantage. So going for some trades there are okay. And I'm able to you know, get them in a pretty bad spot. I do need to be a little bit more careful now because I, my health is low. So if I got hit with one more colossal sword, I would have died, but I was able to play it a little bit more passively since deadly poison was chipping them at a pretty significant rate. This final duel is gonna be against a player that switches over to the Watchdog Greatsword pretty quickly. And they're also utilizing the kind of status effect negation that comes with the Spiral Horn Shield and probably change their talismans as well. And you'll see how that comes into effect where here we're able to land the Viper Bite even after hitting them at least once with the Stone Club, which is poison buildup. And we're not able to proc poison. So they did a great job of kind of punishing one of the main aspects of this build. And in a situation like that, switching away your talisman of Kindred Rot if you don't have that on and switching it to something like the Claw Talisman or the Rotten Wing Sword Insignia would be a good way to kind of counter their counter of the poison of this build. So we are in a pretty decent spot. They go for a Poison Ballas, which is a little bit harder to punish with this setup just because the range of the Stone Club isn't great. I find that a jumping attack is usually the best way to punish a Ballas use, and there you can see we do actually land one. So they went for it at kind of a bad time that I wasn't far away enough and we were able to come out on top there. As always, if you made it this far, I just wanted to say thanks so much for watching. I definitely appreciate all the support. And if you have any build suggestions or just general questions about this build, definitely let me know. I'm always happy to take a look at new build ideas or answer questions in the comments. Yeah, that's all I've got, and I hope you have a good one.